The following interview was conducted with Richard A. Freeman, Dick Freeman, Bachelor of Science 1950 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, December 5th, 2008 at Stewart Center. This is part two of the interview. Welcome. I want to pick up where we left off, and I thought I'd start with telling us a little bit about more about the research and your involvement with the Amelia Earhart uh, searching and things of that sort and your research in that area, since we have the collection here. Um, you know, I've spent, uh, Katie, I've spent, well, 25, 30 years working on this uh, particular problem, and... Uh, um, Did, were there any excursions, or can you tell us a little bit oh, about... I, yes, yeah, I've, okay. I've, made, uh, I've made a number of trips to the uh, Pacific, uh, which means that I've covered the, uh, the area of approximately from um, uh, where she took off to Howland Island and, and most of the routes that she would have flown. So this includes uh, all of Micronesia. And my trips have been principally to, uh, to the Mariana Islands, um, Guam and Saipan, and to the Marshall Islands. Uh, which include a string in, of, of atolls in the Ratak chain, uh, which includes Majuro and uh, and several of the other islands on each side of Majuro. And I expect there have been, um, oh, let's say 15, maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 trips that I've made. Each trip, of course, uh, has had a length of anywhere from two to six weeks. Um, some of these trips have have included, uh, and I have to kind of laugh about this, uh, uh, trips in the jungle uh, to look at various aircraft that have been found in the uh, in the jungle and the growth that, that, that occurs in, in some of these jungles in these uh, outlying islands is very, very thick, sometimes as much as four or five feet off the jungle floor in terms of growth that's just kind of died and fallen to the ground. But you can, um, as you walk through the jungle, in areas like that, you can hear the, the crunch of aluminum beneath your feet. And so you know that there's something there, it, it's, and the chances are pretty good it's an airplane. Um, so we've investigated, or I have investigated, a number of these um, um, atolls, particularly in the marshals, looking for her aircraft. Uh, I was told by one individual who was the chief of one of the islands, um, uh, the atoll being Mili, M-I-L-I. The Mili Atoll was where it's believed by, by most folks, including me, that she landed. And this is a small atoll south uh, and a little east of Majuro. And um, she landed on the interior of the, of the island, the, the beach on the uh, on the side that faces the lagoon and and most of these beaches are beautiful by the way uh, quite wide uh, almost flat smooth hard and so forth make good landing areas uh, the chief that told me about her landing there was a small boy um, would have been in the of course in the late 30s 30 this was that would be in 37 and uh, he saw the landing according to what he told me. And as the airplane rolled out, it it hit a tree, it hit a palm tree, and tore off the right wing. Um, he's pretty specific about it being the right wing and not the left wing. In any event, um, there are some stamps that the Marshallese have produced uh, with pictures of, the, of her airplane uh, on the stamp in this configuration with the, with the right wing torn off. So obviously a lot of people in the Marshalls believe that because um, she's fairly well known there. And, uh, and, I, and I think in some ways they've, they maybe exploit her name a bit, particularly on their coins and stamps. So yes, I've had a, a number of trips into Micronesia and uh, looking for evidence of the airplane. I must tell you I've seen, I have not seen any evidence whatsoever of her aircraft. I do believe that the aircraft was was picked off Mili Atoll uh, by a Japanese uh, steamer and was taken to Saipan. And it is now either 
on Saipan in a bomb crater or in a what might amount to a scrapyard, uh, or possibly, and I think this is the chance of this is remote, that it was uh, taken to Japan. Some, some people say that the airplane's in Japan. I believe it's probably still, what's left of it is still on the uh, island of Saipan. Does that answer your question? Yes. Have you ever been there? To, have you gone to Saipan? Oh, yes, many times. Okay. I've been to Saipan. Uh, Saipan was one of the sites of one of the battles of World War II. Yes, and I recall that. And uh, it's, it is full of, I've been all over that island, looking everywhere. I've been at every airfield. There were two, two major airfields. Actually, there were three airfields, but there were two major ones. And what happened after the war is all this stuff was, the, the war, uh, the, the, the junk of war was uh, scraped by bulldozers into shell holes and, and covered up. Right. All over that, all over the islands, they mass the removal. In yes, the, right. Uh, in one place, in Guam, for instance, all of the war uh, material that was left over was piled up, and a, and a uh, groin was made to form Apra Harbor. Wow! And that and that groin is um, well, maybe a, a three quarters of a mile long. Mm. And, and surfaced with concrete, and underneath it are is all this junk, old tanks, aircraft, guns, bullets, whatever, um, and parts of concrete of the buildings that were torn down. Wow. All of that forms a groin that, that forms the seaward side on the, uh, on the western side of the island of uh, Guam. Oh, okay. So this is throughout the Pacific yeah. that this was done. Have you found anything any, on your trips at all, anything that would lead you to think that it did belong to her? Have you re recovered anything like that? No, your, nothing. No? Oh, nothing okay. at all. Okay. I've seen, I've, I've, I've run down people who said that they had a propeller or they said they had a, uh, uh, a generator or a piece of the airplane. I know all the serial numbers of of all the parts of the airplane, mm -hmm. and uh, I've not been able to confirm any anything on any of the islands. Um, I believe that the airplane did, as I say, it did end up on on Saipan. Okay, okay. Probably in there with all that other stuff. So it's uh, and you just can't imagine the junk. That's I happening. can well imagine there was a heavily uh, used. Um, oh. Activity battles during the war. <laughs> and the air, one airplane stacked on top of another and then crushed. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh dear. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Do you have it? Um, the old masters. You've been. You indicate yes. you were uh, started that program, right? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. how did tell uh, us how that came about. Oh yeah, I'd be tickled to. Uh, in the in 1949, um, I ran for. Uh, while I was still, uh, I was would have been a senior at that time. I may have run for it as a junior, but anyway, I ran for the uh, <clears throat> the office of representative at large on the student council, and uh, and was elected. Uh, there were two of us elected at that at that time, a, a man and a woman, and um, we formed a, a part of the student council. The student council, I believe, had twelve members, and um, during the sessions that. That I, I made a proposal to them that to the student council that we have a uh, that we put together a program which would benefit our seniors. I was looking primarily at people that were just about ready to go out into industry, and and felt it would be nice if we had some prosperous and and successful um, members of industry uh, come and talk to us and give us an idea of of what really went on when you report in for a job, because none of us knew, of course. And everybody thought that was a pretty good idea. So we had, we got some very good faculty support by uh, Dean Schleiman, as I recall, and um, a man from the uh, Dean of Men's Office. Um, I want to say the name Gross. That right? may not be that name. But we did have good support from both Dean of Men and Dean of Women, as well as um, Eth Baugh, 
who was then uh, head of the Purdue Alumni Association, who was a member of the student council. And they thought this was a very good idea. And of course, Eth uh, would have been the guy that would have made the arrangements uh, for them to stay at the at the uh, union building. Um, and everybody, our student council got together and looked at this and studied it for a while. And and we had, I think it was 100% of the student council voted in favor of this program. And we named it the Old Masters Program. And I always thought it was a kind of a, uh, I was hoping that somebody would come up with a better name than that. I didn't, I didn't like the word old. But, but anyway, I think others have thought that too, you know, over time. <laughs> uh, but so far, it's maintained that same name. Yeah, it's maintained and, uh, the name, and it's maintained. Uh, right. We only had a, the first ones that came in. I think there were only two people that came to the first one. Okay. Well, at least that I was. I think they were, and I think they were local. Well, that made it a little bit easier anyway to get the thing off the ground. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, another thing, I'm switching a little bit, that uh, building of the red. Uh, the Redbird Campus. Yes. Um, yes. You share a little bit on that particular publication, which we do have a copy in the archives. Yeah, I your would father was in. Was your father involved with that interview? Oh my, yes, yes, okay. he was very much involved with it. Oh good. Um, in fact, the uh, the interview uh, was done in our living room. Oh wow. Uh, the, the Did you, you probably the, didn't tape it though. <laughs> uh, no, my dad taped it. <laughs> oh, whatever. He taped it. Whatever happened to the tape? Well, the tape is, I don't know where it is. Um, <laughs> I can give you some clues as to where it might be. Okay. Um, but I remember that he um, had the, um, uh, had covered the machine up, the, the, the recording machine up, with a, had to cover it up with newspapers um, because um, the guy that he was interviewing was kind of, you know, was, was a little bit... Uh, scared of microphones and and seeing all this equipment in front of him so my dad just threw a bunch of papers over the over the uh, recording device and I think it was a it was tape it wasn't wire as I remember it was sure. tape I imagine in those days that's what it was and the, what the book that I have it says uh, the building of a red brick campus and it says to my pal my partner and my son Richard D Freeman <laughs> 12183 <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now those copies are very scarce. <laughs> well, you know, it would be a neat thing to find that tape. To, you were, to um, yeah. And 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 one of the people that might know where it is is Fern Honeywell. Fern Honeywell Martin. Um, you know who she was? She was with the uh, County Historical Society. Oh, okay. Right. I recognize the name, but she's no longer with them. I don't think. No. I no. She's she lives out on the. Um, South what was River, it? South Fern River. Honeywell, what was her name? Um, Fern? It's Fern, F E R N. Right. Fern Honeywell Martin. Martin, okay. And she lives on the South River Road. All right, fine. I will touch base with her. Please do that. All she right, is well. so neat at yeah, stuff like to talk that. She, she could share a lot of things for our program, I think, would be good. <laughs> she okay. is. So, I, you know, she and I were first friends. Uh huh. When we were really. Uh, kids, we lived on Marsteller Street in a duplex. Okay. And the Honeywells lived on one side and the Freemans on the other. In the duplex, of the duplex? In the si duplex. Was side by side? Yeah. Oh, super. What is it? And they had one girl and, of course, my folks had one boy and <laughs> we were Fern and Dick. And we, so I call her my first friend. <laughs> I think that sounds good. <laughs> oh, I think the last time we talked, you were on the Dean's Advisory Committee, the inaugural one. Yes. Um, and how did how did that come about? Did did, did Emily call you or tell yeah, you? Yeah, Emily got in touch with me and, okay. and said that she was putting a group together to. Because uh, this was a first for her. We didn't have had not had a similar committee before. No, this was it. it, it no. Mm -hmm. And um, she had, uh, I think Fred Billerbeck was one of the ones that she also talked to. Sure, and he was on the inaugural committee. And Fred is just a one of the fine alumni of. Of right. Purdue and has, uh, I think, has endowed the library with a number. That of the them. limited editions collection. Which yeah, is the really, limited. I right. think he's. I think he's brought almost every one of those in. Pretty much, it's it's pretty uh, pretty complete now. Yeah, Fred is a, oh, he's a marvelous man. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, yeah I saw I, them briefly when really. they were here for the meeting. I just happened to run into them in the corridor. Yeah. Uh, they always dropped in when they came for the meeting. 
um, but then they then you were on the committee for and then you were for several years. Yes, I think um, I you know I, I met you on while I was on that committee. Right, and you did one of the back to campus programs on Amelia. And I did the first back to campus that's program right. for the library and for Emily. Right. And that's kind of what I think that was may have been our first meeting. I think so. Right yeah. around in there. Right. Exactly. And I was so tickled to to be able to have the library involved in that program. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think you've remained involved, have you not? Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Our oral history is part of the Archives of Special Collections. Well, I was, thinking more, I was thinking more along the line of this Back to Campus program. Uh, do not, sort of. I, mean, I attend the programs. We did one this year. Sammy and uh, um, one of the other people in the archives did one on the Women's Archives. It was very good, very well oh, attended. Uh -huh. So, and Susan Butler was there, so it was it worked out really, really well. It was a nice, nice turnout for that. Yeah. Um, President's. I, I believe I remember. Wasn't Helen? I remember the name Helen Schroyer. Helen Schroyer. That's right. She was special collections at that. That's time. correct. And when she retired, that's how I Emily asked me to step in there as the ah, intern person. Okay. That's okay. what it came about. Yeah. And Helen retired. Well, she, I bugged poor Helen Schroyer to death with the Amelia thing. Oh, did you? <laughs> 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 she actually, I think she finally got tired of seeing me. Oh, no, I don't think so. We never do. We don't get tired. We just get better. Um, how about the President's Council? Have you been involved with that? Uh, only only as a member. I haven't, okay. I haven't really contributed very much. Mostly mostly I'm a taker, not a giver. Okay. Well, when and you're on campus. It's a good program. Yeah, it I is love good. It. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, awards and honors. Let's talk a little bit about that. You got the Distinguished Engineering Alumnus in 73. Yes, and the uh, man of the year from the Sigma Alpha Tau Honorary. Yes, that's true. Let's talk yeah. a little bit. You got some others. The Lifetime Achievement, or also from the uh, from Kappa Sigma fraternity, and you're in the yeah, Hall of Fame. The, yeah, the Hall of Fame uh, of Kappa Sig, and yeah. and they've done a number of nice things uh, for me, and and um, way above and beyond the call. And then just here, um, oh, about a month ago, uh, I was uh, uh, honored by the. Exchange, the National Exchange Club of America, mm -hmm. and uh, they give out an award each year, and and uh, that they refer to as a court of honor, and so they uh, bestowed that honor on me. Congratulations! This year. Very yeah, nice. I, I was very right. It, it's a service organization, and I've, I've I'm very I'm very uh, it, it's a very enjoyable thing to do, and I. You've been involved with the exchange over time. Yes, for right. about oh, 15 years or so. Sure. Right, yeah. And, and uh, that particular honor is one that I treasure um, since it only is given out once a year. Oh, congratulations. That's very yeah. nice. Yes. Oh, thank okay. you. Um, let's talk um, Chauncey Village uh, yes. in the 1930s and 40s. What was, <laughs> what was that like? I you're, can tell you every building that was in the Chauncey. That would, and every, in, and every, what, in five or ten minutes or less, right? <laughs> or maybe less. <laughs> well, of course, you'd... You'd start with Harry Merrick. You <laughs> right. know who he is? Oh, I I know of him. <laughs> I've heard other stories. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, he Harry, was an institution oh in his gosh, own yeah. right. <laughs> well, he had a he had a daughter named Joanne. Okay. And Joanne and I were classmates and went out occasionally as we got as got older, and then young then he had a son named Harry. Okay. Uh, young son and and I think Harry, the younger Harry, took over when. Harry he, Senior. He would be the one I probably remember. Yeah, you, know. you might remember him. Right. He was a Kappa Sig, by the way. We pledged him at the Kappa Sig house, so we'd always have a warm stool at the bar. <laughs> always a method to what their plans yeah. are, right? There you go. And right next to right next to Harry's was a place called Red's Barber Shop. Oh, huh. Which and is I now think, which is now Vaughn's? No, I think oh. I think what happened is that oh. the uh, the the um, chocolate shop took that over so they've enlarged Harry's and took over what had been the barber shop. Oh, I see. Okay. It used to be a little bit smaller than what it is now. Yeah. Harry's did. I see. Okay. Yeah. But in and then the, the next thing the thing next door to the barber shop was a place called Deeks. I don't know is that I think that's gone. I believe it, so. Right. It was a bookstore. Mm hmm Okay. And and next to that was Edgerton's hardware. Ooh, sounds good. <laughs> And then next to that was Lux and Humphreys, which was a grocery store that delivered. Can you believe that? Uh, yes, I can. Lux and Humphreys. <laughs> I remember <Bill> deliveries. <laughs> yeah. And next to that was the post office, and that was the entire 
uh, south side of the village. Wow. And then what would have been across the street from that? Was and across the, the street from the post office, of course, was the Purdue National Bank, which was on that little spur oh, that stuck that's still up. there. That's, that's a Sullivan building, my, uh, the architect from Chicago. And I think Bank One's in there, that's, right? Now it's Chase. Now it's Chase. That's okay. right, yeah. But that was the Purdue State Bank. Mm -hmm. Right. Then across from that was the was the laundry um, that did soft dry. <laughs> that would not be. Would that be Hudlow's? No, it wasn't. Oh, Hudlow's oh. was down at oh, about still, a block further down. Oh, where it is today? Yeah, called West Side Cleaners. Oh, okay. Except I knew I knew all the Hudlow's very well, and we called it. I always called it the Rip Tear and Shrink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it was, it was Crown Laundry. That was It was Crown Laundry on the corner. Okay. And then coming west from Crown Laundry was a arts uh, uh, drugstore, then Southworth, and then, and Southworth was a bookstore. I, I don't, is it still a bookstore? Mm, it was Follett's, Follett's, and then further up right on the corner, you know, was the university bookstore. Well, yeah, but before that, uh, uh, was, might, it was Southworth. It probably was, yeah, but now it's called yeah. Fowlitz. And okay. then from Southworth, the same thing next to that was Gullion's clothing store. Okay. And and Elmer Gullion sold to uh, some guys across the pond, or across the Wabash, and, uh, and they moved in and gave it a different name. I forget what it was. And then next door to that was a little restaurant. Hmm. And then there was an empty lot, which is now um, right on the corner, and I think that became a sorority house. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was the entire village. Those are all the... Was, wasn't the Varsity Apartment built? The Varsity Apartment was there, okay. and it was across the street from that empty right. lot. Right, across from Andrew Place. Yes, right. and then the, then the next thing after that was a little teeny thing called Dad's Popcorn. Do you ever remember going there? Nope, I don't even remember that. And it was a, just a, it was a hole in the wall, and I don't know how much popcorn he must have sold out of that place. <laughs> popcorn and apples and that sort of thing. Ooh, and, sounds good. <laughs> and he was an institution, and then of course next to that was Swindler's Restaurant, and and Swindler's is now the bookstore you referred to. A uh, university bookstore. Yeah, right okay. across the street from the Union. Okay. But that used to be Swindler's uh, Restaurant. Oh. Listen, this is a great tour. I, I feel like I'm walking right hand in hand with you. You're pointing out all these structures. It's very, very visible to me. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. And then the, the, you, I think you talked a little bit before, but uh, a little bit further on that one uh, laptop per child that you were talking oh, about yes, your colleague. Yes. Just f a few more comments on that would be oh, helpful. I, yeah, I'd like very much sure. to do that. The, um, the, I have one of them right in front of me right now, and it's a dandy huh. little uh, device that is um, is given uh, out to uh, to countries that are willing to sponsor, and, and all although uh, most of the time they don't need to put up money, but some of the countries do. And the program was started by a guy by the name of uh, Nicholas Negro Ponte, uh, who is one of the officials at the United Nations, and and Nicholas and his board of directors, which include a young man by the name of Scott Sung that I've been mentoring for 15 years now. I guess it's more than that, but anyway, it's 15 years. And Scott Sung um, is the heir apparent to one of the large Taiwanese companies uh, called uh, Maite, and uh, they do about $10 billion a year, and they're the guys that build this one laptop per child. Um, or do the final assembly and um, box it up and get it ready to go out to the kids. And, it, and when I say it's a laptop, it's pretty small. It's maybe um, 12 inches by 10 inches and maybe an inch thick. Um, but it has, uh, and it has a full keyboard, um, um, and, but it's a very special and, and carefully designed keyboard. And then it has uh, small Wi-Fi ears on it uh, that can pick up uh, and put the kids online. So the kids that get this, uh, uh, there's no instructions, by the way, that come with a computer. They just open it up and start pressing buttons, and 
and it doesn't take very long. I've I've tried a couple of kids here in in my study. Have brought them in and just handed them a cube computer without even telling them how to open it. And within 15 minutes, or usually or less, they're online. So pretty knowledgeable. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to watch them. Oh yeah, they figure they figure <laughs> that out. It's like playing with the Legos. My brother used to do, you know, or the Lincoln Logs. I don't know what it is. It it, it seems to be some sort of an maybe inherited trait that they. They seem to have. I, I can pick it up. It will take me two hours to get it going, but they can do it in 15 minutes. <laughs> I know. I'm coming on late in the, in the system. <laughs> uh, but the delightful program that's been very, very successful, they're building these things at the rate of um, over 100000 a month. Wow. And Man. shipping them all around the world. And what a marvelous opportunity. Right. Have they really pretty much uh, covered pretty quite a few of the countries already? Well, they have, and oh. and some are very some of the countries are very uh, very helpful. Brazil has been quite good. Uh, Haiti, um, some of the countries in the Middle East um, have have been interested, and there are some countries in the um, um, in in the in China, and I know my friend Scott has. Uh, travels around the world meeting with various heads of states um, in conjunction with the program uh -huh. yeah, to bring them the program and 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 a number of companies here in the US have been sponsors so that the, the, the usually the child doesn't ever pay for the computer that's great which by the way costs around I think the last thing I heard from Scott was I think it's around a hundred and seventy dollars and that's mm -hmm. a factory cost mm-hmm mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty good deal. So it's you know for the kids it's a really good deal, and right. they've and they've got it set up so that it doesn't even require power. The, uh, the it uses solar power, of course, mm -hmm. and it can be um, it can be charged with a uh, it can be charged with a little hand crank. Oh, okay. So there are various ways of getting power to it, so that particularly in those places where power is yeah, really on the, no on the low end. Yeah. And and I've heard stories um, from Scott. Uh, that tell me that that in some of these places where these computers end up, they have no lights, of course, in, in inside in, mm -hmm. the, in their in their home, and they use the light of this screen. If you can imagine such a thing, Katie. Wow. but if something is better than nothing, it, they didn't yeah. get some some illumination from it. Yeah, can you believe that? Yeah. But they, that's what they, yeah. that's what he says they're doing. They don't uh, do they say? Can they save it, their material at all? And what about print? Yes, uh, oh. there's no way of printing. Okay, but they can uh, but, save it. But they can save it. Okay. Now, there's a very good memory system in it, um, and and it also includes uh, the ability to do uh, artwork and uh, compose music. Wow. Um, and the thing that really intrigues me is there's a Bible chip, <laughs> so that the complete Bible is is available. Oh. And mm. and I think that's. You know, That's really we, nice. We what work to get day. Bibles in the hands of people around the world, and here it is getting into the hands of kids. Sure. That's right. <laughs> um, do they do any upgrades at all? I, I don't know of any. Oh, okay. And I know so that these they've are... made some manufacturing changes, uh -huh. but the out, outside of the computer has pretty much remained the same. Oh, okay. Okay. And they have a number of programs where... Um, you and I can participate, a, a buy one, get one free sort of thing. Oh, okay. And so you send in, say, $300, and I think they'll send you a computer, and and then they give one to a kid. Hmm. Oh, that's right. So, that so they've really got a number of Little pro programs. things going on that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. By the way, if anybody's interested, go to, on, on online, go to, just go to OLPC. OLPC, okay. One laptop per child. And, it, and they've got some, their website is excellent. Okay, I'm, I'm making a note on that, great. OLPC.com. That's all, uh, dot .com, but it stands for the one laptop per child, right? right. Uh huh. Okay, great, okie doke. Great, great okay. program. I'm very pleased to be associated yeah, with it. Sounds good. Um, cl the class of 1950 Hall, were you involved in that? Yes, I was. That? Tell us, make some comments on that, of course, for the researchers, John Norbrook wrote well, the I book, <laughs> and, and you're a class member, and. I've interviewed yeah, a couple I'm, of other I'm, of your members, such as Maury Williamson. <laughs> yeah, and two or three other guys. Um, well, one of my friends was sitting here at our house one day, and we, we were talking about doing this. Um, 
and he was on the library committee at the time mm-hmm. and had stopped by here and his home was in Pasadena or his his family home had been in Pasadena so he and his wife got out, got out here quite often at any rate he was sitting there and he said you know we're going to do this statue of a Purdue ed and a Purdue co-ed but he said we want the the Purdue ed we need a a pair of of, uh, of cords that seniors wore, and and also we're going to use a flight jacket. And so as he was talking, I got up and went upstairs, and I still had my senior cords. And I brought those down, and I handed to him, and and along with my leather A2 jacket. So the 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 senior that's uh, that's in the in the hall is is dressed in my in my senior cords. Oh wow. <laughs> How nice! How nice! Yeah, it is a great statue. It is a great statue. It really is. The sculpture is excellent. I, yeah, I, I first saw it with Bill Creason, and Bill Creason was the. I wish he was still with us. He what a grand uh, benefactor he was for Purdue, uh-huh. and he was president of a class of fifty, and was the guy I think the principal guy that made made this uh, made the whole building. thing go. Yeah, made it all go yeah. together. Good. It's a really nice. How about family? Tell us a little bit about that. Were your children did they any come to Purdue? Uh, no, they. Okay. Um, all my kids were went to different schools. I, I expect because we moved around quite a bit in okay. the aerospace business. Okay. Okay. But they all managed to graduate. Oh, that's um, good. Do any of the, any of them live close to you? Live in California? We have. Yeah, I have four children, and three of them live within a mile of each other. Uh, in a, a town of Lake Forest, which is about 20 miles from where we live, uh-huh. so we get to see them. We we all get together for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Sure. And That's the each time. other during the year. And I have another son living in South Carolina, and um, he will be retiring. Can you believe that? My goodness, <laughs> he'll be retiring next year, and he plans to come out here. So the entire family. We'll all be there. We'll all be here, <laughs> we'll, living we'll, in Newport Beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll visit when we go to the Rose Bowl again. Not this yeah, year, though. We yeah, said, we're sending Penn State. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. How about uh, what? what is your favorite Purdue tradition, or do you have more than one? Well, I, um, uh, uh, there's, there are several. Um, Good. The, the one that I always enjoyed the most was Hello Walk, and uh, I made a thing of kind of going up and down that that walk. First of all, it was across from my dad's building, which was called Ag Hall. Right. And uh, the pathway came from University Hall, and went around, uh, kind of made a little quarter circle, and came to the main entrance there at Purdue on State Street. And that walk, by tradition, uh, you had to say hello to anyone you met. And I always enjoyed that. I made friends on that on that walk. <laughs> I'll have and to try that. I don't think they do that. They're rushing too fast. <laughs> yeah, they all rush today, and, and, and they're missing a grand tradition. That's right. They don't catch those plaques that are down there On now. The low walk, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh. And uh, as you look back, any summary or some closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers? Um, well, um, I'll leave it up to you. One of the things that you and I have talked a bit about is the machine gun range, I, and okay. that, that, right. that tickles my fancy because uh, right. Dean Hawkins and the group that worked there uh, did some, I think, some really outstanding work that is still being used today, primarily in metallurgy mm-hmm. and, um, and the use of materi- different materials in gun barrels uh, that, that kept the barrels from expanding as much under heat as they as they do, uh, as they were doing when they when the program started there at Purdue, and the little building that we used is still still standing. Where I think I, I think I told you about where, that. It's, yeah, but where is it located? Well, it's uh, kind of kitty cornered. Um, uh, it would be roughly east of the of Hovde Hall. Okay. And it's a one-story, small brick, one-story building that sits across the road from Hovde Hall and right next to the Mechanical Engineering Building. Is that not railway? Is that the railway one? Well, and, and right okay. behind it is oh, right. the railway building. Okay, I see. Where they tested axles and uh, draw bar oh. um, kinds of tests for, for locomotives. When they were As doing you know, all, right, their research that they, with the engines. Yeah, Purdue did an awful lot of work at, at, during the time of the railroads on, on uh, uh, engineering for uh, what 
to have what strength you needed for hooking up cars and and the journal bearings and the wear on the bearings and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It was some really outstanding work that was performed right. by Purdue. Right, yeah. And they had, we had our tracks here to take care of the engine, get and them the here. the tracks came through, <laughs> and as you may know, there was an old locomotive that sat right behind Michael Golden Shops in its own little building. Oh, okay. And they would fire that up and, uh, and run it right in the building. Um, and the last time I was in that building, uh, the building's since been torn down. Mm. Um, but but Audrey Potter asked me one time. He said, "Would you see if you could find that locomotive?" So I went all over the place looking. I wrote letters by the scores, looking for that locomotive. And um, uh, finally, um, um, I think the locomotive ended up at the Ford Museum. Is what I think. But the Ford Museum, when I talked to them, got very angry at me because I kept saying that and said, no, that's our engine, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, later, Bob Topping and I, yeah, do, do, you know, do you know Bob? Oh, yeah, I've interview I did interview Bob, which is Oh, not, did you? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's so fun. I love yeah. him. Yeah. I've got his book here in front of me called A Century and Beyond. Yeah, well, I use that a lot. It's a good book. Yeah. All right. All right. At any rate, Bob and I found uh, photographs of the cab of that locomotive, but we never were able to find the locomotive itself, and I had to, was forced finally to tell Dean Potter that I couldn't find the, the locomotive, and I, I'm afraid maybe it, it's either at the Ford Museum or, or it got scrapped. <laughs> By the way, have you ever seen uh, his book, Potter's book, called oh. The Dean? Yes, yes, we have a copy in the archives, and I've yeah. looked at it tonight. It's a good book. And a good book, and, and covers some of the traditions we're talking about. That's right, exactly, exactly, yeah. Any other closing uh, comments, Dick, that you can that you like to share? I love Purdue. Okay. Gotta always come. will, always have, always will. Well, going to come back sometime and visit us? <laughs> I hope to. Well, now that we have we'll now that it. we have a new coach, you know, you have to. We, we at least we got the bucket back this year. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's right. But I think you know I've watched the libraries grow. Uh, through the years. Well, you got to come and see so, our new facility. I am so tickled with what you guys are doing in the libraries. Thank you. We're very I just, pleased. I think the world of you and your and the, and the staff there, and gosh, I am just pleased as punch to see. I think the Purdue Library at one time years ago was probably number 10 in the Big Ten, and I think today that's it's got to be awfully close yeah, to number we're, one. Yeah, we've moved up, right. Yeah. You sure have. Right, yeah. Dick, and, I want by, and because of people like you, Katie. <laughs> thank you very much. Dick, <laughs> I want to thank you very much, okay? This yeah. ends the interview, but don't get all. I want a couple comments I want to say to you.